name's Mohammed Amgad. Um, I graduated from uh, Cairo University School of Medicine uh, in 2016, and this is Puya, who um, got his uh, master's degree in, in uh, Iran before coming into the U.S. for his PhD. Uh, we're both um, PhD candidates uh, in the Cancer Data Science Lab with uh, uh, Dr. Lee Cooper, who you might know from the uh, machine learning class. And uh, our work focuses on uh, prognostication, so figuring out how long people live uh, based on how their histology images uh, look like or the images taken from their tumors look like, uh, and, and their genomics and other things. So I'm going to go into some detail there. All right. So first of all, what is histology? Histology is the art uh, slash science of looking at tissues and um, and kind of uh, figuring out how long uh, people uh, have or what type of tumor they, they have and, and things like that. So uh, in this case, let's say this is a, a breast tumor. Oh, something that's kind of out of place, but this is a breast tumor. And then, you know, there's two ways we primarily do imaging, which is kind of the most objective way we can look at things in medicine. One is radiology, uh, uh, you know, like mammograms or, or uh, CT or whatever. And the other, histology, was, which is basically taking biopsy or, or actually, you know, when you remove the tumor itself, you look at it under the microscope and you, you know, see what, what is going on. So what you're seeing here is basically the tissue being cut. So we literally take this tissue out, we put it in a paraffin block, and then we put it in something called a microtome and we cut it, and then into very, very thin sections, and then we paste these on a glass slide, and then someone looks at that. Uh, of course, we stain it, we put two stains on, you know, it's called methoxylin, and one is called the eosin, they're called counter stains because they stain different components of the cell, of the, sorry, the tissue. And then a, a specialized doctor known as pathologist looks at those and, and uh, figures out what is the subtype, like what type of tumor it is, how long is the patient expected to live, what kind of chemotherapy they should get, or whether they should get chemotherapy in the first place, uh, and things like that. So that is what histology, that's kind of the backstory of, of the work that we do. Um, so in recent years, um, there's been a, a movement to do these kinds of analysis uh, uh, more systematically and computationally. And the first thing you want to do, of course, when you do these things, is to digitize the slides. Uh, you can't you know, work with a physical slide. So uh, there's been uh, this uh, revolution, if you will, in, uh, in whole slide scanning. So a whole slide microscope is, uh, is literally a microscope that has very high throughput, very high quality scanning of the slides, that, and it makes humongous images you know, on the order of 8,000 by 8,000 pixels or something. 80,000 by 80,000 pixels. So very, very huge images. And then uh, our lab, in collaboration with uh, uh, David Gutman's lab and, and a company called Kitware, um, uh, so they got this $3 million dollar grant to make this uh, software that looks at, at slides, manages, uh, looks at like uh, digitized slides, manages these, uh, uh, facilitates annotation and you know drawing polygonal boundaries around things that you think are interesting, uh, do analysis uh, in silico, in silico, i.e. like computational analyses and things like that. So, you know these things, you know when you, usually when when you were doing the analysis day and night, you're thinking. Uh, you know, this is just an image, but really the, the backstory is that this is a tissue that came from a patient, it was canned, and then there's all this background work that's, you know, that's happening in terms of the data management. So uh, I'm going to lead off by uh, my part of the talk, which is um, using crowdsourcing to kind of speed up and, uh, and, uh, and uh, acquire a large amount of data that we can use to train models. So, Know, one thing you, you might be asking is, is why is this an interesting problem? Uh, I'm not going to get to that, that in a second, but let me first uh, show you what is the difference between these uh, two uh, approaches. What you're seeing here is uh, a small part um, uh, from a glass slide. Uh, the colors, of course, are, are artificial. They, these are outputs from some of our algorithms. And the red stuff is tumor. Uh, these are the cells that are multiplying rapidly and killing the patient. Uh, the yellow stuff is necrosis, which is dead tissue because it's not receiving enough blood. Um, and then the blue stuff is your immune system trying to get to the tumor and kill it. So before we do any analysis, the first thing we want to do is to be able to map out these various semantic elements, to be able to know where are these things in the slide. Because 
because you know if you have a picture of a cat and a dog, the first step in the analysis is first detect the cat and dog, and then later on decide what to do with it. Uh, you know, I don't know sentiment analysis, I guess. Maybe not. Um, so on the left, what you see is the semantic segmentation approach, uh, or a semantic segmentation kind of view of the tissue, which is like regions, right? So this is kind of a tumor region. It's more geographic, more uh, high level. And then on the right, you see uh, the object uh, detection or object segmentation approach, which is to look at the individual nuclei and individual cells. And uh, these are uh, complementary approaches. They have different uses and uh, you know, will be technical. So there are uh, essentially two approaches to do analysis of histology and just computational analysis. Uh, one, the upper one is the one I'll be talking about, and the bottom one is where what uh, my friend Puyo will be talking about. So, the upper one, which is learning from semantic representation, means you first extract these elements from the tissue. You first know that this is a tumor, <coughs> that this is lymphocyte, that this is a, uh, a macrophage cell. You, you know what these elements are, and then you have a model that takes these representations in and learns to predict outcomes or learns to predict gene expression or various things about your patient. Um, now, this is definitely interpretable because you know that this is based on this being tumor or this being lymphocyte, uh, but obviously it's a little more biased than this approach which directly looks at the image and, immediate, and, and predicts some kind of outcome without anything intermediate that we humans need to understand. So uh, these two approaches kind of have this balance between um, accuracy and inter or yeah accuracy if you will and interpretability, and we kind of try to tackle both ways. Um, so the work I'm presenting now is based on a on a paper that we just published in bioinformatics with 30 co-authors, and uh, the reason there's 30 co-authors is because there's uh, 25 people who did the annotation. So I just before I begin anything, I just want to acknowledge their contribution. Uh, really, without their help, uh, you know, nothing would be possible. Uh, another uh, disclaimer, a lot of this work was uh, co-funded by the company Roche, uh, which is one of the pharmaceutical giants, and I go back and forth there. Um, they, they fund the, the work, so that's a disclaimer. Um, first of all, so why the hassle? Uh, why, why do we care about this kind of thing? Um, well, let me jump, jump in here. Uh, you probably are all familiar with ImageNet uh, and the various, you know, COCO, you know, all, all these data sets that we use in, in, in imaging. And these are usually, you know, multi-million image data sets that people use to train image analysis algorithms. Um, and the way these are annotated, so you're probably familiar with convolutional network. You take an image, uh, it goes through a series of filters, and then it uses uh, uh, gradient backpropagation to kind of uh, in an unbiased way, you learn how to map an image to a series of probabilities, you know, uh, uh, whether this is dog, cat, etc. Right? Um, the problem is that these models need lots and lots of examples to train. Uh, and in histology, which requires a lot of expert knowledge, we don't really have that. So there is no ImageNet in histology. Um, and, uh, and that lack of data, unfortunately, has not been tackled. Uh, n nobody, most of the people, and uh, would just do the analysis on a small set of uh, examples that they annotated locally. Sometimes, uh, you know, I saw a paper <coughs> in Transactions of Medical Imaging, which is considered a big journal, based on six slides. Imagine that. Uh, so, the lack of data is, in my opinion, and many people's opinion, is, is really limiting the field of computational histology or computational. And that's what we're trying to tackle. These things need data, and we don't have data. The problem is, though, these things are usually annotated by, by people. You know, you just go uh, on, on you know, some online website where you can annotate things, and you know what a dog looks like, you know what a cat looks like. You don't need training for that. Even if you do, it's a simple training. Uh, unfortunately, in histology, this is not exactly the case. So what you're seeing here is, is a very normal example where it's, it's not just the color, it's not just the texture, but there are all these subtle patterns. So this is tumor, this is actually not tumor, these are activated stroma, these are um, uh, fibroblasts, which are like things that make the supporting tissue that were irritated by the tumor surrounding and they gain this phenotype or this shape. So it's not very clear how we can do that in histology without experts, and then expert time is very expensive. So that's the back story. 
Uh, and that led to calls for open <coughs> access, large scale annotation data sets. Um, and this was you know, actually published a while back. I think it was in 2013, was it? 2015. Um, and you know, the human genome was sequenced in 2001. Uh, and you know, ImageNet has been around for quite a while now, uh, but really nothing of that sort. So, um, you know, people have been thinking about crowdsourcing, and we were not the first to uh, contemplate the idea of crowdsourcing. So, uh, of course, in non-medical domains, there are people that uh, have been using crowdsourcing, obviously, for things like ImageNet and, and whatnot. Uh, but even in pathology, there has been some work um, for doing it. But unfortunately, most of the work was based on very simple, either, uh, either just uh, image classification in, in small patches, uh, or, or, or in the background of you know uh, malaria, that things where you, you know there are no experts and, and you just want a very small, uh, quick data set. So it was not really systematically examined at all. Uh, the only things reminiscent of uh, an approach to this uh, were a study by uh, uh, Andy Beck's lab, and then they uh, it was a small scale study again based on very small images, not these whole slide images that showed that they they were able to use non-experts to reach kind of similar concordance to pathologists. And that was kind of the backstory of, we decided, all right, you know, this may work, uh, but let's see if we can scale this up and we can uh, systematically examine it and so on. Um, there is a large-scale data set, only one large-scale data set known as the Chameleon data set. That was published in uh, 2016, and it, it basically, um, when people have breast cancer, sometimes they get metastasis, which is are spreading to their lymph nodes. And this looks at um, examining the small pieces of cancer in a lymph node. Um, this was uh, not annotated by non-experts. It took a humongous amount of effort, a whole swath of, of uh, pathologists annotating, and uh, it was done at low power, so it's also not, it was a binary problem, so it's also not a, uh, a proper uh, annotation. So, we said, okay, let's see what we need to tackle this. So first of all, a little background on the composition of a, of a breast uh, uh, tumor. Um, these are some of the typical elements that you see. You see tumor regions, you see tumor nuclei, these uh, dark red things. Um, you see some stroma, these, this green background, which is the collagen and all that surrounding tissue. Um, you see lymphocytes, which is your immune system that is trying to attack the tumor. Uh, and sometimes you see dead tissue and debris depending on where you are looking at the tissue. Uh, so as you can see, sometimes these all look pretty much the same. So it, it does need a little bit of training and you know, to, to just figure out how these look uh, from, from the images. So first thing we have to des decide on is what tumor uh, to, to annotate. So we said, okay, we'll focus on a subtype of breast cancer known as triple negative breast cancer. Uh, now, triple negative means that there are no hormone receptors on the cells, on the tumor cells of the breast. And um, unfortunately for these patients, these hormone receptors are the basis of most of our existing chemotherapeutics for breast cancer. Uh, uh, so uh, ER, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2 amplification, these kinds of expression receptors are, are what dark, uh, drugs usually target. But uh, in a subtype of breast cancer, all of these are negative. And unfortunately for those patients, there's no uh, real targeted treatment. Uh, so we just use the traditional chemotherapy, which is like kill everything that is dividing. Which is kind of sad. So we thought, OK, first things first, let's try to let's focus on this data set because it's clinically important. So. Um, we use the DSA, the Digital Slide Archive Interface that I talked about earlier, that was developed in our lab. And um, this is what a typical annotation looks like. So this is a, a very large uh, chunk of the slide. This is uh, on the order of um, uh, 7,000 by 7,000 pixels. Uh, and people just go and draw boundaries uh, and, uh, you know, and then assign the classes. And then you know, there's all this iterative feedback from senior pathologists. So, I'm going to mention. So first of all, the logistics, how this all works, this is probably the most difficult part. Uh, the algorithms are more of a commodity really in this space. <coughs> we want to see if we can get the data. So um, first of all, how long does it take to annotate one of those ROIs? Um, it, depending on the complexity of the tissue, it may take three hours, four hours, something, something like that. But um, yeah, three hours or four hours is, is very difficult. And 
I'm not even counting the corrections and the, you know, all the other back, background stuff. So it takes a lot of time to, to get these right. Um, so we got all the breast cancer, the triple negative core from the uh, TCGA. We kind of did some initial triaging, like sorting out the slides by level of difficulty as, uh, as a senior pathologist kind of sees it. This one looks difficult, this one's less. The tissue here is, is more spread out and so on. Uh, we recruit people, uh, we use uh, social media for recruitment, and then we, uh, some of the novelty is in using uh, a more kind of hierarchical uh, structure <clears throat> for, uh, for, for the annotation. So the difficult slides were handled by the senior pathologists, the ones where, whose time is expensive, right? People who, who have been practicing this day and night, they don't have any time. Uh, and then the, the majority of the work uh, is done by those uh, less experienced people. Uh, but then after they, they are trained, but then the question is, can we trust the annotations from these people? You can probably not publish without really addressing that. Um, uh, so that's what we did. We there was a this feed, kind of feedback loop. We used Slack and you know, uh, uh, so the ESA for annotation. People post questions on Slack. Pathologists give corrections, and then pathologists go on the annotation interface, and they they make all sorts of like corrections directly. So there's an iterative loop of people annotating, asking questions, getting feedback, and then the pathologist going and correcting things. Um, also, this was, so this was done in a supervised manner. We call this the core set. Um, another set, we call the evaluation set, is done in a completely unsupervised manner. And the way this works is that for uh, 10 regions of interest, uh, we let everybody annotate those. So the pathologist, the non-pathologist, everyone annotates uh, these ones without getting any feedback, just after they get their initial training. And the idea being that uh, we use this to evaluate how people look relative, relative to each other uh, if they didn't get the feedback. So it gives us a, a measure of the quality, it gives us a measure of, of, of uh, kind of objectively how people are relative to each other. Uh, and then we, you know, use various metrics like the uh, dice coefficient or intersection over union to measure the inter-rater variability and you know, various things that we can use to judge quality. So again, I, I'm not going to talk about this again. We use Slack and, uh, sorry, Slack and the digital slide uh, archive. I have a quick question. Yeah. So if you go back to the previous slide, um, so in the course and assignment phase, I'm just trying to make sure I understand the process, mm -hmm. are all <coughs> slides consulted by at least one person at every level. So the two senior pathologists have to do, look at everything that the 20 non-pathologists look at. That is correct. Okay. That is correct. Um, yeah, so this interface, even though it was uh, init kind of initially developed, like, there was a huge amount of tweaking that we, we did along the way. Uh, and it's, it's interesting how much change you can have to do in a, in a user interface just given as you have more and more users work with it. So, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of it, kind of informatics uh, or database, you know, aspects going into that. Yeah. You kind of mentioned this when you had your interpreter, but can you explain why those metrics, uh, segmentation or representation are important? Because ultimately, a pathologist, you know, looks at a slide and say, yes or no, there's cancer. And why do we need to know what regions have? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So, there are a lot of patterns where it's not just there is tumor or not tumor. So, um, first of all, the different histologic subtypes, their difference is in how these regions are relative to each other. So, you know, infiltrating ductals, they're spreading like this, infiltrating lobulars, they're more uh, elongated in how the regions are, the shape and the geography of how these things are relative to each other really make all, all the difference. Um, another aspect is the, the pathologists, um, kind of have all of these things in the guidelines uh, and they integrate all this knowledge to, to get an initial assessment. The tumor looks ugly. They say, they literally use the word ugly. But in the background, what's happening, they're looking at how the tumor cells, uh, the nuclei are, uh, whether they have multiple nucleoli, are, they, uh, are there any weird nuclei that have, uh, cells that have multiple nuclei called multinucleated giant cells. So there's all this visual and pattern recognition work that goes into Deciding, oh, this is a great core infiltrating ductal carcinoma or something like that. You know what I mean? You know, for instance, we just going to talk about uh, machine learning and doing that sort of thinking as a pathologist. 
Um, so the machines are taking over. But in a way, what we really hope to achieve is to have something to work on either assisting pathologists, finding these things more objectively, uh, or finding things that are just not possible to find using just the human observer, like spatial relationships, clustering, these kinds of things, and then link them to various outcomes. So there's all this work happening in the background in terms of parsing the polygons, how do we count something as a correction, because uh, usually when you think of, of correcting, you know, you can correct the classification, you know, just change the label, but how can you correct the segmentation that someone did? So we had to deal with, you know, these kind of weird issues, or oh, maybe the, what we had the pathologists do is they just place the corrections on top and then we patch them, uh, and, you know, there are all kinds of weird things that just are specific to the semantic segmentation problem. Usually those kind of projects, you don't really have corrections in the non-pathology domain. So we kind of had to deal with that. So the, there's an API that we use to, to query those annotations, which are in kind of in JSON formats. <coughs> and then we, we handle all these things to convert from uh, coordinates to a mask. And then we, uh, we push the mask back uh, for secondary review by the pathologist. And then uh, you know this iterative process uh, takes place. And then once we're satisfied, we just download the, you know, we, we parse the final data set, which is both the masks and the X1 coordinates. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time in that. Basically, these are the iterator um, statistics from the various observers. And all, all you need to really care about here is that uh, for the predominant classes, so here's the tumor, which is kind of the, 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 the main class is tumor, not tumor, right? The predominant class in the, in, in the regions of interest. Uh, for the predominant class, the iterator variability is actually quite low. So if you train the observers, there's very little iterator. Um, there is high iterator variability for subjective classes like let me say infiltration or necrosis or the whatnot. Uh, and that's kind of really the main theme that, that you know I want you to get out of here is that so the pink ones are the non pathologists, the blue ones, the these light blue and then the dark pink are the pathologists, and you can see the difference between the two CM pathologists is similar to the distance between any non pathologist. That's kind of the main thing. Uh, another thing we did is we just did two dimensional embedding, you know, multi-dimensional scaling of the data. So this is just looking at the discordance values uh, so that we can represent each person, each person's segmentation as a, um, a pair of coordinates, x, y coordinates. And uh, again, you see the senior pathologists, the distance between them and their location relative to everyone else is, uh, you know, they're, 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 you can't systematically see any clustering by experience. That's the key idea. So what do we do with this data? Uh, we, uh, we said, okay, let's, let's try to use this. So we used something called the fully convolutional network, or FCN, which is basically, most people are familiar with, with uh, you know, convolutional neural networks, which is this part. Uh, a fully convolutional network, uh, basically, after doing a series of convolutions, which decrease the size, we do a series of uh, transpose convolutions, uh, which essentially blow up. It's, uh, it's called learned upsampling. You learn how to increase. Uh, the size of that, because as you know, max pooling and all these um, operations decrease the, the feature map. So we learn to upsample those. Uh, so that's 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 really we, did, we didn't invent that. That's, that's been there for a while. And then the, what the FCN outputs is a, a feature map that is as big as the original image, uh, but with as many channels as there are classes. So if each pixel gets a probability map, a soft max probability map being assigned, being in one class or the other class, right? The class, right? So it's, a, it's like a classification problem but for each pixel. So uh, the boring stuff like all the data wrangling, we, uh, we focus our analysis on a subset of the data, the infiltrating duct holes, uh, which is kind of a, a, a kind of more uniform, to more uniformly train the model. You don't want to train the model on two different problems, right? Um, we uh, focus on uh, five key classes, so it's a five class classification problem. Um, here's one thing where we kind of borrowed a little bit from the clinical world, which is uh, we, we separate the training and testing by the center or the hospital from which the data came. And usually for, for proper and, and well-validated clinical studies, they do that to just ensure um, uh, you know, that the testing data set is, is you know, generalization, uh, generalized as well. 
And then there's, you know, we did color normalization for the images. We just make sure they have similar color properties. And, you know. um, then, so because this is a fully convolutional model, um, while training, you can uh, use the same sizes just to make sure that the, that the, the model has good learning behavior. But because it's a fully convolutional, you, you, your sizes are not fixed. So at inference time, even though you can train on 800 by 800 patches, uh, at inference time, uh, you can do inference on 2K by 2K image at a time. That's, that's not a problem. Because what you, what you really learn are just these convolutional weights, which is a sliding filter. It has no memory of the, the size of the image. So that's what we do. It kind of speeds up the inference. Um, we use overlapping tiles uh, as sort of shift augmentation. Um, and we use all, all other things that are used in the you know, kind of this kind of practice. Yeah. What's your stride when you create these overlapping tiles? Uh, the stride is half the tile size. So oh, okay. four. Yeah. Um, we thought this is like the most. Uh, but actually, this is, this is not accurate. So what we did is, depending on the center, depending on the, the ROI, some ROIs are much larger than others. So if, a, if an ROI is small, we use a smaller stride to have a so, sort of equal number of tiles from different regions of interest, okay. just okay. to make sure there's a, a well-behaved data set. When you say small, I mean, you said 80,000 by 80,000 before. So what's small in this? Oh, no, no, no. It's like, it's, a, like we, it's programmatic. Like we, we see relative to the largest ROI, then this one needs to be 10 times more represented than the bigger image here. So the largest image, the tiles were only 400, and then the smaller ones, there was much smaller sprite size. Does that make sense? Yeah. <coughs> Do you have concern that now these tiles, they're not independent representations anymore because they contain the same data? Yeah, that's okay, because that's training. It's not, it's not inference. So, so during, during training, we shuffle things. This is a form of augmentation. It's done, it's done to improve the robustness of the model. Because you don't want it to declare at the same area having a different class just because it's a little bit shifted. But also, um, so earlier you kind of mentioned this, like, oh yeah, we need a lot of data. Um, and so for this model, how many parameters do you have? Like, what, how much data do you actually need to train this model? And like, do you have like a calculation for that? Any sort of sense? Um, I don't. But that's a good question. So yeah, I I, I don't I don't really have that. Um, anyway, so we did you know shift augmentation and on the fly prop augmentation, all sorts of things that you use in in training these models. Um, and then, you know, this is just kind of a qualitative examination of the results. You see, this, these are all segmentation results. You see the boundaries really correspond well with the tissue and, uh, you know, the AUC results. Now, there is no data set, you know, uh, state of the art to compare to, but generally speaking, when you see, you know, AUCs of higher than 90, you, you, you kind of know you're, you're, you're in the right track. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm going to jump through this just because we're putting some time. But uh, the second phase of the project, so that was the part that we published, the second phase of this project is saying, all right, uh, we want to take this to the next level and really predict nuclei. So regions are these like kind of geographic elements that you see here. This is one region. Uh, this whole thing would be one region. This would be a few room size. Can we, can we really learn to predict these individual elements, these individual object, objects? Now you can see this is a kind of a harder uh, problem because there's much more of them. And it's hard to get data and to know where to focus on the slide. So we came up with this kind of scheme for um, initializing the models for or, or the annotations for people. So we take a region, so we have this region mask, and then we use uh, traditional image processing, Gaussian smoothing and thresholding and, and you know all sorts of uh, traditional processing to to get a, an initialization of of the annotation. So we, we say we think this is a tumor. We think this is the segmented boundaries. Now this is, of course, going to be very noisy, uh, but the point is to just have something for people to start with. Uh, so given this initialized, uh, you know, object detection and object segmentation map, we select fields of view, also programmatically based on the confidence of the classifier. So what we use here is after we get these um, noisy annotations, we use them to train uh, something called a mask RCNN. Uh, which is an object detection and segmentation model. Again, we didn't invent that. And then based on the object, uh, based on the classifier confidence, we kind of know which FOVs are kind of more problematic in learning. So that guides us to, to, to that tells us 
which fields of view, which small fields of view do you have people annotating? Besides, so some high class, high confidence ones, some low confidence ones, just to get a, a good, you know, balanced data set. And given that, we have people correct things, and instead of them drawing boundaries, they can just, for example, place a dot and say, okay, this is a good segmentation, this is a bad segmentation. Um, yeah, so this has been going on for maybe three weeks now. We have 39,000 objects that have been annotated so far. Uh, we expect at uh, least 10 times that number, so, uh, you know, with, as more people annotate things, you know, things really scale up. And then this was a small analysis that we did using uh, some preliminary data that we had, just showing that when we, when we calculate something called TILS, the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, uh, we can get similar separation on a survival curve as a pathologist would do, and the inter-observer variability between pathologists among each other for detecting these TILS is actually, the correlation is even lower than we get from a computational algorithm with the consensus of the pathology. So sometimes when you really get these things right, you can, uh, you can improve the uh, objectivity and, and consistency that we do.